This is The Writer. Sculpted by Giancarlo Neri, this desk and chair stood 30 feet tall, made with 6 tons of steel and 1,000 pounds of wood paneling. From June 22nd to October 9th, 2005, it loomed over Parliament Hill Fields in Hampstead Heath, London. A tribute to the loneliness of writing. It was a polarizing piece. Some found it striking, while others just saw a gimmick, only notable for its size. It's true that its design is not very intricate, but that isn't the point. It's not a work that could be understood in a vacuum. You have to take into account where and how it was displayed. It wasn't placed in some sterile museum exhibit. I don't think there's a museum large enough to fit it. Instead, it was in a public space, exposed to the elements and onlookers. Neri leaned into this. He encouraged people to physically interact with it. It was shelter, a picnic spot, soccer goalposts, a climbing challenge. In almost every photo of the structure, there's someone else there. But the crowds feel... disconnected. It's almost like a forced perspective trick. Someone standing right under it might as well be miles away. Even when surrounded by people, the writer stands alone. You've probably heard this one before. If a tree falls in a forest and no one is around to hear it, does it still make a sound? Oh my god! Okay. I want to ask a corollary question. If you create something, a poem, a painting, a sculpture, and no one else sees it, is it still art? Where in the process of creation is the status of art given? Is it when a creator puts enough skill or intention into something? Or is it when an audience appreciates it? What exactly is the relationship between artist and audience? What's the relationship between art and the world? Why do we make art in the first place? In our last video, we covered two painting games. Art School, and Passepartout, The Starving Artist. These games had plenty to say, but they sidestepped these questions entirely. Either the audience did not exist, or your interaction with them was kept to a minimum. They placed their artists in isolation. For this video, I want to cover two games that take the opposite approach, Eastshade and The Rains Down Players. In both games, you play as artists exploring vibrant fantasy communities, and your creative output is defined by a connection to the world and its inhabitants. Eshade is, at a glance, an unremarkable place. It's a small island with only two towns to its name. It used to be a trading hotspot, but its importance has waned over time. When I was a boy, merchants came to Lindau with strange spices and soft fabrics. They haven't been back in a long time though. It maintains its relevance through the city of Nava, a prestigious university town established during more prosperous days. Lindau is a nice port town. Although we don't have much to export anymore, aside from loom sacks. Now most of our tourism these days are just people passing through, on the way in or on the way out of Nava. Throughout the game, you come across several people who feel confined by Eastshade's limiting shores, who want to go out and see the world. My dad loves the farm, and I do too. Oh, but the sea, just thinking of it makes me want to sing forever. But if you look closer, you'll find a place full of natural beauty and a rich history. From its bustling marketplace, to its soothing hot springs, to its snow-capped mountain, it's easy to see how someone could fall in love with this place. You play as a nameless painter, grieving over their mother's recent death. 
She had once called East Shade her home, and frequently told you about its charms. Before she died, she left you with one last wish. That you experience East Shade for yourself and paint its four most beautiful landmarks. The city of Rainsdown, by contrast, is not exactly a beautiful place. Named after its near constant rainfall, Rainsdown is an impoverished town built over flooded swampland. Its buildings are leaky, its architecture is crumbling, and organized crime lurks in the shadows. Adding insult to injury, across the riverbank is the Walled City, a wealthy area reserved for nobles. It's not the kind of place people would want to live in, but people do live there. Working, playing, and trying to make the best out of a bad situation. And where there's people, there's a demand for entertainment. You play as a duo of player named stage actors. I called mine Jesse and James. Prepare for trouble! Make it double! To protect the world from devastation! To unite all peoples within our nation! To denounce the evils of truth and love! To extend our reach to the stars above! Jesse! James! Team Rocket, blast off at the speed of light! Surrender now or prepare to fight! Me! Oh, that's right! Together, they resurrect Rainsdown's long abandoned theater scene, performing plays from their dingy stage and breathing new life into their overlooked district. Art School and Passepartout were games that let you be intimate with the artistic process. Each brushstroke was your brushstroke. You had direct control. E-Shade and the Rainsdown players, by contrast, give a more hands-off approach. The protagonist of E-Shade is a painter, but here painting feels more like photography. When you find something you want to paint, you open your inventory, choose a canvas, set the borders, and click. A painting materializes in front of you. Well, I knew it would look amazing in flight! You're pretty quick with that painting business. In the Rainsdown players, each performance starts with a limited writing process, but once you take the stage, Jesse and James perform on their own. The player's input is just a rhythm minigame to keep them from tripping over their feet or getting pelted by Rainsdown's enthusiastic crowds. This isn't a criticism. These games just have different goals. They're focused on exploring interesting settings, and art is just a means of interacting with them. In art school and Passepartout, art was the only thing you could do. You were an artist first and a person second. East Shade and the Rainsdown players give you more options. If the former two were games about artists, then these games are about people who create art. It sounds like splitting hairs, but it's an important distinction. After all, One's a person, the other's a job. Recently, Squarespace released an ad called 5 to 9, where Dolly Parton rewrites 9 to 5, a song about how the 8 hour workday is draining and dehumanizing, to a song about how great it is to come home for your 8 hour workday and work 4 more hours on your side hustle with the help of a great website from Squarespace. They then were surprised that people found an ad pushing for a 12-hour workday kind of horrifying. Now, this isn't a call-out. Considering the amount of charitable work Parton does, I'm sure the money is going to a good place. And a website hosting service isn't solely responsible for wider labor trends. Please sponsor me, Squarespace. I have 44 whole subscribers. Rather, it's emblematic of something larger. Right now, America has an unhealthy relationship with overwork. You eat a coffee for lunch. You follow through on your follow through. Sleep deprivation is your drug of choice. You might be a doer. You're never going to be able to retire. Wash it your boots. Farmers don't get retirement plans. Okay by Jeanette. Support small. Pick purple. Jeanette Nichols has never had a day off. Someone please help Jeanette Nichols, that is a smile of desperation. Compared to these ads, the 5 to 9 ad takes a notably different approach. It uses liberatory language, talking about passion, vision, dreams, and giving your life meaning. 
It's not about working yourself to the bone, it's about doing what you love. If you love what you do, you never work a day in your life, right? And when you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. But that's bullshit. I love what I do, and let me tell you something. I've worked some days. Unfortunately, work being your passion doesn't counter long hours, deadlines, wage worries, and all the other struggles of a job. I am going to throw myself into the sea. Mia Tokumitsu's In the Name of Love highlights the harm done by this mindset. There's little doubt that do what you love is now the unofficial work mantra for our time. The problem is that it leads not to salvation, but to the devaluation of actual work, including the very work it pretends to elevate, and more importantly, the dehumanization of the vast majority of laborers. Aside from further dividing workers on class lines, ignoring unlovable but necessary work like sanitation work, she points out that this mantra harms workers in lovable fields. Ironically, do what you love reinforces exploitation, even within the so-called lovable professions where off-the-clock, underpaid, or unpaid labor is the new norm. Reporters expected to do the work of their laid-off photographers, publicists expected to pin and tweet on the weekends, the 46% of the workforce expected to check their work email on sick days. Nothing makes exploitation go down easier than convincing workers that they're doing what they love. It should be no surprise that unpaid interns abound in fields that are highly socially desirable, including fashion, media, and the arts. These industries have long been accustomed to masses of employees willing to work for social currency instead of actual wages, all in the name of love. This is a consistent problem for artists. Twitter accounts like For Exposure and Clients From Hell are filled with stories of people expecting artists to work for little to no compensation. It's made worse by social media algorithms pushing for constant production and engagement. There's no clearer example than the website we're on right now. Creating videos for YouTube full-time is a stressful job. We regularly hear about creator burnout dealing with long hours, stressful audience interactions, and constant performance auditing. And while I genuinely don't care about growing the channel or becoming more popular or some kind of personality, I can think of very little more nauseating. <laughs> Having your actual numerical value constantly fluctuate right before your eyes with YouTube, the platform that claims to care so much about creator mental health, telling you your content is bad and you should feel bad, threatening you with the idea that you just might not be able to sustain this on your own for much longer, it has an effect after a while. It's enough of a problem that YouTube was forced to address it in their YouTube Creator Academy, encouraging users to pace themselves. They have good advice, but as Big Joel points out in his video, The Strange World of YouTube Corporate Propaganda, there's a core contradiction here. All of these things make perfect sense. Of course, you should take care of yourself. But what I find odd and almost surreal about these videos is how they contrast with how the YouTube Creator Academy and YouTube in general actually work. Across all the videos on the Academy, we frequently hear about how important it is to stay in contact with your audience. It makes audiences feel great to hear creators respond, make videos based on their suggestions, be present on chats with them. We hear about consistency in videos, how even if you make polished, scripted content, it's a good idea to supplement that with check-ins and the like. We're directed to spend a lot of attention on our analytics. Recently, YouTube changed its Creator Studio UI, and the most primary, obvious difference between the new studio and the old one is that now we get to hear constant audits of our performance. This video isn't doing so hot, you've been slacking off this month and haven't gotten as many subs. Consider doing better, doing more. And yet, within this conversation, all of those behaviors are placed squarely on the shoulders of creators, a problem they have to solve. YouTube doesn't actually want you to devote years of your life to making consistent content for their website. They don't want you to feel obligated to engage with your audiences constantly. Wait, when they started having their robot tell you that you're a failure every month, they didn't want you to, like, care about that. 
YouTube created an environment that incentivizes overwork and recognizes it as a problem, but not enough of one to actually change their incentives. We still want you to overwork, but overwork healthier. If a friend came up to you and said, hey, I'm gonna go run 50 miles and refuse to eat, sleep, or take care of myself until I'm done, you'd be like, no, you doof, that's a horrible idea. You need sunscreen first. Why does YouTube keep running with these systems knowing that they're breaking people? Well, YouTube has a practical monopoly on user-generated video. If one person has a breakdown, three more will pop up in their place. They don't have to worry about running people off their site. I mean, where else will they go? Dailymotion? Vimeo? But YouTube is hurting itself here as well. This hyper-optimized approach encourages rushed and sloppy work. It discourages experimentation and makes creators afraid of leaving their niche. With so little downtime and so little room to explore, it's like the site was designed to deny creators inspiration. There's a saying that art is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. That's true, but iron is less than 1% of a body, and without it you kind of have a bad time. Both games are centered around inspiration, taking an abstract concept and turning it into a tangible resource. For each shade, inspiration is a currency. You have a stock of inspiration points, and you spend one every time you make a painting. In the Rains Down players, inspiration is a tool. You write performances by slotting different inspiration cards into plot spaces. The subject of the play, their location, their goal, what they encounter, and the outcome. The audience responds based on how well the cards you chose fit with each other. In both cases, if you focus solely on creating, you'll burn yourself out. You'll have no points to spend or exhaust all possible combinations. So how do you gain more inspiration? Well, there are plenty of ways. Exploring, camping, fishing, canoeing, more fishing, canoeing, biking, yoga, reading, visiting the library, visiting the sewers, scavenging, littering, stealing, listening to stories, listening to music, playing an instrument, playing children's card games, gambling on children's card games, carnival games, sleeping, having dreams, sleeping, having nightmares, sleeping, getting drunk, getting high, putting an animal in a box, stare, 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 Paperwork, paying taxes, avoiding taxes, hunting for ghosts, committing arson, solving mysteries, rewriting history, and whatever this is. You gain inspiration by just going out and experiencing the world. Both games take a similar approach to world building. Fantasy stories, especially in games, tend to be country-spanning or globe-trotting affairs. You wrote a whole world, you might as well show it off. These two games are more restrained, giving us small, detailed settings with melting pot cultures that imply a much larger world. The world of East Shade is inhabited by monkey people, deer people, bear people, owl people, and vaguely Hispanic badgers. And the variety! Is it true that there are bear folk? Do they have temper like a bear? I, I don't like the implications of this question. The world of Rainsdown is similarly diverse, with humans, cat people, bird people, orcs, Darth Mauls, ghosts, goblins, reptiles, different reptiles, more different reptiles, rich people, and egg. Getting to know these people is crucial to each game. They're not only your clients, they're your neighbors. In the beginning of East Shade, the painter's ship crashes near the shore. Everyone survives, save for this ship. Annabelle! My ship! My wooden, sea-loving daughter! <sighs> Killed by the damn reefs when we came into this miserable town. 
But the painter arrives with only the clothes on his back and the easel he clutched onto. This lack of equipment and money is what limits exploration and paces the game. You can't leave the starting town until you pay a small toll fee at the bridge. Despite said bridge being completely unguarded. I guess he's, he's just polite? It's freezing at night, so you can't wander too far away from inns until you buy a coat. Half the map is blocked off by rivers, but your character can't swim, and you need to get a raft to cross. You essentially busk your way across the island, fulfilling painting requests for money, items, or crafting recipes. These requests tend to test your knowledge of the environment. Someone will ask for a painting of a shoreline or a windmill, and you have to remember where you've seen one. Where did I see a tiny stone bridge? Where do I find a painting of a cave that looks like a starry night? Where did I see a man doubled over in agony? Also, why do you want me to paint that? It's a relaxing game that encourages you to just slowly go about and drink in your surroundings. Rainstone's world isn't as expansive or visually detailed, which makes sense given that it was a one-man project, so the focus instead shifts from the environment and landmarks to people watching. In between performances, Jesse and James can go out and explore the town, gauging the audience and seeing what's on people's minds. Both of your actors have pretty diametric personalities. James is an impulsive social butterfly, who's willing to drum up conversation with anybody. Jesse is more reserved but more perceptive, making observations about people and things from afar. Switching between their perspectives not only gives you a better sense of their characters, but each one gives different clues on what the audience is looking for. If someone seems interested or anxious about something, then you can write a play about it. Say someone feels trapped in their dead-end job? Write a play about someone being trapped to inspire them. A musician feels anxious about their career prospects? Write a play where a musician gets fat stacks of cash. When you talk to someone that liked your performance, they tend to say something that will give you a new inspiration card, which will allow you to perform more plays, which will get you more inspiration cards. I admit, it is kind of weird to write a play specifically for Phil in the third row who you've never really talked to but know all about. Hey, why are you inching toward the exit, Phil? This is for you! But it's a system that encourages you to keep everyone in mind, even incidental characters. They're not just an audience to score points off of, they're all individuals with their own lives. In each game, everything you do eventually feeds back into art, giving you more subject matter and experience. But art is far from the only thing you do. They both have objectives that have nothing to do with art, like collecting water samples for a researcher, finding lost pet frogs, or giving romantic advice to lesbian bears. I think I want to ask her if she'll be my girlfriend. And let me tell you, I am not qualified for that one. But it makes sense. After all, there are plenty of problems that art can't solve. If you're an artist or someone deeply invested in art, then it's a safe bet that art changed your life. Some man-made experience changed how you view the world or made you feel something you've never felt before. I know this is true for me, at least. But because of this, we tend to overestimate the power of art. I mean, if I was changed for the better, then everyone can be changed for the better, right? All it takes to fix a problem is the proper empathy-generating narrative or image. But reality is a lot more complicated. One of the most famous examples of artifacting policy is Upton Sinclair's The Jungle, a novel whose stark depiction of the meatpacking industry led to mass reforms in the Meat Inspection Act. The thing is, meat industry reform wasn't Sinclair's primary goal. He did care about it, I mean the man went undercover in meatpacking plants for research, he was probably happy to see the improvements. 
But he was an open socialist. He didn't want to just engender disgust with meat, he wanted to engender disgust with capitalism as a whole. That didn't happen. In Sinclair's own words, I aimed at the public's heart, and by accident I hit it in the stomach. It can be argued that every piece of political art has fallen short of its intended effect. 1984 didn't stop the development of the surveillance state. To Kill a Mockingbird didn't end racism in the justice system. And a plethora of anti-war art hasn't kept us out of forever war, just given us reason to feel bad about it. I know I'm being overly pessimistic. I shouldn't completely write off the good that art can do. We have plenty of studies showing the positive effects of good representation. Besides, if art was truly powerless, then the CIA wouldn't bother influencing it. Shut up! My dad works for the Central Intelligence Agency and can get your entire neighborhood addicted to cr art. We wanted to unite all the people who were writers, who were musicians, who were artists to demonstrate that the West and the United States was devoted to freedom of expression and to intellectual achievement without any frigid barriers as to what you must write and what you must say, what you must do and what you must paint, which was what was going on in the Soviet Union. I think it was the most important division that the agency had, and I think that it played an enormous role in the Cold War. The Cold War was unique in the sheer number of fronts it was fought on. I don't just mean the proxy wars, like Vietnam and Afghanistan. It wasn't just a contest over land and resources, it was a war of ideas. Just what kind of society would be best moving forward from the rubble of World War II? Everything that could be compared was part of the conflict. Military power, standards of living, industrial capabilities, scientific discoveries, international sports, the space race, human rights, and most importantly for our purposes, arts and culture. The Congress for Cultural Freedom, founded in 1950, was an artistic advocacy group that published 28 different literary journals throughout the world, alongside hosting art exhibitions, international conferences, and seminars. Also, it was a false front organization for the CIA. Through this and other covert organizations, they acted as patrons, providing funding and support to artists whose works lined up with their ideological goals. Most of the time, neither the audience nor the artist knew it was government backing. In his memoirs, Nabokov wrote, Not in my wildest dreams could I have expected that my dream festival would be supported by America's spying establishment. Nor did I know the fare for my delightful first-class flight to Paris was being paid by the CIA. To pursue its underground interest in America's lefty avant-garde, the CIA had to be sure that its patronage could not be discovered. Matters of this sort could only have been done at two or three removes, former CIA officer Donald Jameson explained, so that there wouldn't be any question of having to clear Jackson Pollock, for example, or do anything that would involve these people in the organization. And it couldn't have been any closer, because most of them were people who had very little respect for the government in particular, and certainly none for the CIA. One of their most notable influences is their support of abstract art. At the time, the prototypical Eastern Bloc art style was Soviet realism, idealistic but grounded depictions of proletariat life. The CIA supported abstract artists like Jackson Pollock as a counterpoint. Regarding abstract expressionism, I'd love to be able to say that the CIA invented it just to see what happens in New York and downtown Soho tomorrow, he joked. But I think that what we did really was to recognize the difference. It was recognized that abstract expressionism was the kind of art that made Soviet realism look even more stylized and more rigid and confined than it was, and that relationship was exploited in some of the exhibitions. Now, I don't want to be reductive. The CIA isn't the sole reason that abstract art took off. I spent some time in the previous video defending it, after all. As the latest Star Wars trilogy proved, you can't throw infinite money at something and force success. No art style has any inherent political or national allegiance. America has realist art, and the Soviet Union had abstract art. 
Any analysis of a cultural trend that focuses solely on a single actor or group is bad analysis. And not to defend the CIA, but they weren't unique in doing this. Every major country promotes certain forms of art and discourages others. The fact that it's widespread practice is the point. Individual artists aren't in control of their success or the effect of their art. They can't control who sees it or for what ends it's used. Art can change the world, but only if the material conditions are right. Only if the world allows it. When it became obvious what a dumb and cruel and spiritually and financially and militarily ruinous mistake or war in Vietnam was, every artist worth a damn in this country, every serious writer, painter, stand-up comedian, musician, actor and actress, you name it, came out against the thing. We formed what might be described as a laser beam of protest, with everybody aimed in the same direction, focused and intense. This weapon proved to have the power of a banana cream pie, three feet in diameter, when dropped from the stepladder five feet high. The first time I read this quote was shortly after the election of Donald Trump. Like plenty of people, I believed in the consensus that he was destined to lose. Every talking head ridiculed him, the poll numbers were against him. We had seen plenty of mass media with themes and messages that directly contradicted his beliefs. He came off as the dying gasps of a party that lost its relevance in a more progressive world, a human temper tantrum. And then he won. Over the next four years, progressive art was still made, and Trump was regularly put to the coals by satirists and pundits. But no matter how many mocking impressions, data-informed takedowns, or provocative art pieces, none of it seemed to matter. Art didn't stop him from pulling out of the Paris Climate Accords, from reshaping the Supreme Court, from separating children from their parents at the border. Obvious lies ran rampant, and heartfelt pleas for drastic problems were ignored. This is not a problem that started with Trump. He was simply the most shameless. It's not a problem that will end with him either. It's hard to imagine a return to some mythic bipartisanship after an attempted coup. Solving this will be a lot more complicated than electing whoever promises to not be Trump. This period put me in a bit of a crisis. I lost my belief in not only art, but persuasion in general. Despite all the obvious warnings, this country took the wrong path. Maybe it had taken the wrong path a long time ago. Why write if no one's mind can be changed? Why speak if no one will listen? There's an early optional quest in E-Shade that feels critically important to understanding the game as a whole. When you first enter the starting town of Lindau, you come across a child running around and flapping his arms, saying that he's flying. Aren't I good at flying? It's a small but charming moment that adds a bit more life to the area. Later, when exploring, you can find a man with a jar stuck on his head. It, uh, it, it happens. It's fairly normal, really. Doesn't it happen to you from time to time? This is apparently not the first time he's done this, and the innkeeper tells you to visit his neighbor to borrow some soap. When you talk to her about it, she agrees to help, but seems... concerned. He did? Hmm. Is he... a friend of yours? Ah, well, I shouldn't gossip then. If you press her about it... He's just such a peculiar man. And you know what? I think Lenny is going to have some real issues when he grows up. Well, you've seen him! The boy is unhinged! And not just that. I've been hearing a lot of yelling coming from that house. I think it's quite a broken home. Oh... She asks you to report him to the sheriff in Nava. If you do this, the sheriff just says that it's not their jurisdiction. If you confront the father directly about it... I mean, that nosy, stuck-up, goody, two-talon, 
Ugh. If you had to deal with what I have to deal with. She just doesn't like me because I'm not posh like her. This whole town is stuck up. Them and all their judging eyes. You know what? Get out of my house. You're just like everyone else in this town. Coming in here and telling me I'm a bad father? Get out! And if you don't let up... You're woken by the sheriff who admonishes you for your actions. Listen, I think I know what's going on here. As an official, I'm obliged to tell you in the future, in situations like these, never confront the parent, ever. It's most likely they will deny and defend, and no good can come of that. When you enter his house again, you'll find him despondent on the floor, his son taken away from him, and his reputation in tatters. Fun, 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 fun! Then you help a guy prank his brother by giving him the wrong flavored pastries. This flavor... Grape! My tongue! It'll never be the same! Both games place you in the middle of larger social and political conflicts, and neither of them let you be the key figure that solves them. You're not a hero, a social worker, or a politician. You're just an artist. The city of Rainsdown was literally shaped by political struggle. Fifty years before the start of the game, the country was embroiled in a nationwide civil war, which saw the government move from a monarchy to a republic. Refugees fled to the walled city, seeking shelter and were denied access. With no home to return to, they formed a refugee camp, which eventually became a settlement. Decades later, the nobles of the walled city still want them gone. The constant rain isn't a natural occurrence, it's caused by the walled city magically diverting their rain elsewhere. This isn't a far off conflict, only meant to give texture to the world, it's something you directly confront. Jesse and James's overall goal is to get into the walled city's prestigious festival of dramatics and facing hurdles every step of the way. You learn that the legendary actor Siraj helped end the war with a stirring performance that convinced the queen to abdicate. You're directly told that good art can perform miracles, but the moment to moment gameplay suggests otherwise. You craft plays to help people with their personal issues, but most of the time they fail. A girl is pining for her crush from afar and can't bring herself to confess, so you put on a romantic play to give her confidence. Afterward, she's… well, she's still pining from afar, but she's three feet closer. A concerned older brother is worried about his siblings swimming too far out, so you do a cautionary tale about children getting eaten by sharks. The kids are just excited to see sharks now. A group of researchers want you to put on a PSA about how magical studies is a real and rigorous science, not just wizards arbitrarily doing things. You're directly told that the audience wasn't convinced. Even the people you do help, it's rarely life changing. The person who feels trapped by his job doesn't quit, he just says he'll take some time off. And the anxious musician just pins his hopes on the unlikely chance of finding a wealthy patron. The island of Eastshade isn't defined by one larger conflict, but several smaller ones. There's a struggle between the Roots, a group that uses psychotropic dream teas recreationally, and the Shez, a group who believes it should be reserved for religious use. There's a three-way conflict between an indigenous group that wants to keep a ruin untouched, a university that wants to study it, and a businessman who wants to turn it into a tourist attraction. And then there's everyday dramas, like helping a couple whose relationship is falling apart due to their failing business, or dealing with a huckster selling snake oil. You have a bit more agency to help than in the Rainsdown players, but the quests where you do the most good are the ones that have nothing to do with painting. If art can't solve problems, why bother doing it? Why do you think the first piece of art was made? The first cave painting? The first song? The first story? Now, 
I'm not an anthropologist, or a sociologist, or a historian. I'm a YouTuber, in other words, subhuman. Take what I say with a grain of salt. If I had to hazard a guess, someone experienced something. Maybe they saw a unique animal. They heard a pretty bird song. They had a great hunt. They wanted to show someone else, but the subject vanished. The animal wandered off. The bird flew away, the hunt was over, so they had to recreate it in a rough approximation. If this is true, then the core of art has always been sharing experiences. Even self-directed art, like a personal photograph or a self-indulgent story, follows this pattern. You want your future self to experience something clearly. At the time of writing, America is going through an epidemic. No, not that one. No, not that one. Look, we are a very sick country, okay? What I'm talking about is an epidemic of loneliness. Nearly 1 in 5 Americans, 17%, reported having no one they were close with, marking a 9 percentage point increase from 2013. This jump is not solely attributable to the pandemic. It's something deeper. One in three Americans who say they have no one with whom they have discussed important personal matters in the past six months report that this is due to the coronavirus outbreak. However, the majority say this is not the reason they did not identify any members of their core social network. There's no one cause to this. There's the failures of the nuclear family model, disregard for the elderly, the lack of communal spaces that don't require payment, car culture and lacking public transportation, a demanding work culture, unhealthily structured social media, and so on. There's no one easy solution to this either. At the same time, we've entered a period with a glut of media, countless amounts of books, movies, comics, and games at our fingertips at any given moment. While it's not a causal relationship, I don't think these two things are unrelated. I don't want to be too idealistic here. There are dangers to basing your identity around media properties, and plenty of stories of people getting mistreated in fandom spaces. But even if it's just a band-aid for a much bigger wound, art can bring people together. On a personal level, I have close friends that I would never have met were it not for a coincidental shared interest. And even if a piece of art doesn't open a door to a new friend group, it can remind you that you aren't alone. At their core, both games are about using art to deal with trauma. Like I mentioned earlier, the artist of East Shade is dealing with the death of his mother. He's journeying to Ishe to fulfill her dying wish and find some form of closure. In the Rainstown Players, Jesse was accepted to the Walt City's prestigious theatrical academy, but had to drop out. James didn't start the Rainstown Players just to help the town, he did it to help a friend's damaged confidence and help her achieve a lost dream. But this isn't art therapy. These characters aren't using art to express difficult to process emotions, it's a bit more indirect than that. In Eshade, despite her death being an inciting incident, the painter's mother doesn't have much of a presence. Eshade was once her home, but you never meet anyone who knew her. You don't discover any family secrets or come to a new understanding. It's easy to forget about her up until you paint one of her landmarks and get this pop-up. You've painted one of your mother's most beloved places. To keep it safe, preserve her memory in the painting menu. But in between those moments, the focus is not on your mother or your character. The focus is on the island and its inhabitants, seeing new sights and meeting new people. She sent you there because she wanted you to experience its comforts and community for yourself. The protagonists of the Rainsdown players don't have that sense of discovery. These characters already consider Rainsdown their home. They were born and raised there. But as you go through the game, there's an interesting progression. 
Every time you inspire an audience member, they become a regular, consistently hanging out in the theater lobby. As it becomes more and more crowded, this leaky, dingy building becomes something of a community center, gathering people from all walks of life. This miserable little town gains a reason to come together. From here I'll be talking about ending spoilers. If you want to avoid them, skip to the timestamp on the screen now. Once you paint all four of your mother's favorite landmarks, you end the game by leaving Eshade. As beautiful as it is, your character has a home and life elsewhere. No matter how much you love it, there's no option to make this place your new home. But it's not a complete goodbye. Afterward, you find yourself in your home studio. On the walls are some of the paintings you made on your journey, and scattered around are letters and gifts from the various people you met. Grief is a difficult thing to work through, especially when losing a family member. I doubt the painter is completely over their loss. But while they lost one connection, they gained many others. Their new friends can't replace her, but they can make the void a bit more bearable. Near the end of the Rainsdown players, after many pratfalls, the duo finally earned their place in the Festival of Dramatics. While seeing the venue, Jessie meets an old bully that drove her to breakdown, and while she doesn't forgive him, she seems to come to some sense of closure about her past. Things seem to be looking up. But on the day of the event, the bridge north is still in disrepair and the ferry is non-operational. In an act of petty sabotage, the festival organizer pulled strings and closed the paths to rains down. But that doesn't stop them. Too much has been done and too many people are looking forward to this. In a final desperate bid, the rains down players and their fans trek through the sewers and storm the walled city from below. Security tries to stop them, but too many people are on their side. Art didn't change the enemy's mind. It couldn't, not when they had a vested interest otherwise. And it couldn't change the larger political landscape. Rains down in the walled city are still just as segregated by the end. But Art rallied your allies together, and created a community. Once you take the stage, the game asks you to write one last play to show the upper crust what they've been missing. I wrote a story of a boy and a girl who grew up in a poor rainy town, Despite all their hardships, they found happiness in theater, and eventually took to the royal stage. The Story of the Rains Down Players This is The Writer. Sculpted by Giancarlo Neri, this desk and chair stood 30 feet tall, made with 6 tons of steel and 1,000 pounds of wood paneling. From June 22nd to October 9th, 2005, it loomed over the Parliament Hill fields in Hampstead Heath, London, a tribute to the loneliness of writing. Neri encouraged people to interact with it. It was shelter, a picnic spot, soccer goalposts, a climbing challenge. In almost every photo of the structure, there's someone else there. The writer may stand alone, but the writer brought people together. Before we go, I want to cover the developers of the games in this little two-parter, and what they're currently doing. Glanderco, or Julian Glander, has only made one game aside from art school, 2015's Lovely Weather We're Having. It's a zen little exploration game about wandering outside and talking to your neighbors. He probably wasn't expecting that his game would become escapist fantasy. He primarily works as an illustrator and animator. He's been creating work for the New York Times, The New Yorker, Wired, Disney Channel, Cartoon Network, Adult Swim, and others. I haven't seen any announcement of future game design plans, but if he comes out with another game, I'll be sure to play. This is just the excitement I've been looking for in my life. 
Flamebait Games, the developer of Passport 2, have been busy. They released Verlet Swing, a vaporwave first-person platformer, and Forge and Fight, a multiplayer shooter where you make your own weapons. They also made a prototype for a Passport 2 sequel, Passport 2 The One Man Band, but no word if they're planning on turning it into a full product. East Shade Studios have confirmed that they're making another game, but right now the only information we have is that it's not East Shade 2. So I'm really excited for a new Super East Shade V3 Ultimate Edition, the new Challengers featuring Dante from the Devil May Cry series. In the end, we're all satisfied. Steve O'Gorman, the developer behind the Rainstown players, recently released his second game, Hero Hours Contract. A combination strategy game and life sim, you play as a team of magical girls, who, in between fighting evil by moonlight and winning love by daylight, are attempting to unionize. Charge! Huh? That was Serena's voice. And Princess Rini too! Ed Northam, you got to get this report! You're right, this is no time for games. So what do you all think? Interested in trying any of the games shown here? Any criticisms or additions? Any games like these you want to share? Tell us in the comments below! And if you're feeling as lonely as I am, why not like and subscribe to feel like you're part of a community? This is Else If Games, signing off.